Yes, guys. Can a business intention change subsequently? Yes, it can. I might initially intend it to be held to maturity at that instrument, but subsequently at a later point of time, I intended to sell it off. There is a definite change in the intention. When there is a definite change in the intention, then there has to be a reclassification as well. Where a reclassification happens from a debt instrument which was held as amortized scotch to a fair value through OCI or fair value through PN. Similarly, the other way around is also possible. I initially intended to, uh, to be held for a certain period of time and then I wanted to sell it. But subsequently, I intended to hold it until maturity. So an FET OCI can become an amortized cost. Sometimes I might not have an intention to hold it till maturity or hold it even until a particular point of time. But subsequently, my intention change. So when your business intention changes, even the classification changes. That is the reason why we have to look at reclassification of financial asset. So you can reclassify an initially classified FET PL into FET OCI or amortized cost. Initially reclassified FET OCI to fair value to FET PL or amortized cost or initially classified as amortized cost to FET PL or FET OCI. Whenever such reclassification happens, it should always be reclassified at its fair value on the date of reclassification. On the date of reclassification, it should always be measured at its fair value. Then there will be a difference between uh, the carrying value and the fair value. Yes, there can be a difference between carrying value and fair value, especially when it comes to the concept of amortized cost. Because under amortized cost, we are determining fair value using discounted cash flow approach. Therefore, there is a definite amount of difference which can emerge. Such differences should be either transferred to PNL or should be transferred to OCI depending upon their classification. If you are transferring an amortized cost uh, financial asset to FET OCI, then the difference which emerges should be transferred to OCI. Clear? If it is transferred to FET PL, then the difference in fair value should be transferred to PNL. If it is classified to amortized cost, then the difference or gain or loss should be transferred to your PNL. This difference being transferred to OCI or PNL is depending upon this measurement out here. The gain or loss is being transferred to PNL in the case of amortized cost, transferred to OCI in the case of fair value through OCI, and transferred to PNL in the case of fair value through PNL. So, depending on the classification on today's date, whether the, whenever there is a gain or loss arising due to subsequent reclassification, should be either transferred to PNL or OCI. So this discussion which we had is regarding financial assets. But now let's get into the concept of financial liabilities. Guys, under financial liabilities, there are only two classifications which are possible. Either it should be classified as amortized cost or should be classified as FETPL. That's it. No FET OCI. When should I classify a financial liability as FETPL? I will classify it as FETPL when it is held to maturity or the management irrevocably has designated it as FETPL. If it is held for trading purpose or if it is irrevocably designated as FETPL. If it is not in these two situations, that is it is neither held for trading nor it is de de designated as FETPL, then it should be classified as amortized cost. And remember, there is no reclassification possible for a financial liability between FETPL to amortized cost or amortized cost to FETPL. Reclassification is not possible. Guys, what about the measurement then? Measurement will be the same. Amortized cost or FETPL should always be initially measured at fair value. Subsequent measurement on balance sheet date should be always at amortized cost at effective interest rate using uh, uh, if it is classified as amortized cost. But if it is classified as FETPL, then I have to it subsequently measure on balance sheet date at fair value and the difference of fair value should be transferred to PNL. It is the same thing that we have discussed here. If it is amortized cost or FETPL, initially measured at fair value. If it is amortized cost, then subsequent measurement is at amortized cost using effective interest rate. If it is FETPL, then subsequently measured at fair value. Any difference in fair value should be transferred to PNL. Here, there is no difference. It is exactly the same as we have seen under financial assets. 
let's get into the concept of impairment of financial asset what is this concept of impairment of financial asset and how does it arise and how do i measure it let me tell you impairment of financial assets impairment of financial asset is discussed under para 5.5 .5. This paragraph is a one of the most important paragraph because it uses the word expected credit loss. Be very careful with this word expected credit loss. If someone thought impairment in financial asset means a reduction in value of financial asset is a bad debt, then your answer is yes and no. Bad debt is an impairment. I agree. I'm not saying no, but bad debt is only impairment. No. There could be a situation where it could uh, you could come across an impairment which is not a bad debt, but still there could be an impairment to financial asset. Then question comes up, how do you calculate this and why does this even arise? What is this expected credit loss? Okay, let us come. I am using the word expected credit loss. What is this expected credit loss and why does it occur? Remember guys, this concept of expected credit loss is nothing but, let's say, I sold goods to X. For about a lakh. This transaction happened on 15th of Jan. The credit period allowed is let's say 30 days. That means the amount falls due on 14th of Feb. The amount falls due on 14th of February. But let's say it is a general tendency for X Limited to extend the credit. That means I am expected payment from X Limited is 90 days. That means what? He is utilizing an excess period of credit. For about 60 days is the excess credit. Remember, this is a common scenario in any company that the data does not pay on time. A common problem for any company is this. Okay, uh, especially for CA firms, it is even more because normally our credit period is 365 days. Current year tax audit fee, he will pay only in the next year tax audit time. Okay, so that is how it is. So whenever such kind of events occur, I will say that this 1 lakh is 1 lakh rupee on 14th of January. But I am expecting the payment to be received after 90 days. That is probably I am expecting the payment to be collected after 90 days. That is how much? 3 months, right? So let's say I am expecting the payment to be received on 14th of April. Then I am saying then that 1 lakh on 14th of February is not equal to the 1 lakh which I collected on 14th April. Apply the concept of time value of money. Time value of money is the underlying concept regarding this expected credit loss. So according to your expected credit loss, it says because of the excess 60 days of credit which has been utilized by the uh, customer, I have incurred a credit loss. It would have been 1 lakh had the money received on 14th Feb. But since I am receiving the same 1 lakh on 14th of April, I am saying that 1 lakh which I received on 14th April is not the same value. So I am saying on 14th April, this amount actually which I collected is 1 lakh into present value factor for 60 days. Therefore, it is definitely less than 1 lakh. So the difference between 1 lakh 
and the actual amount measured at fair value or present value should be considered as my expected credit loss. This expected credit loss is of two types. Lifetime expected credit loss, 12 months expected credit loss. What is lifetime expected credit loss? My lifetime expected credit loss means over the lifetime of the enterprise, how much credit period is excess availed by the customer? That estimation is called as lifetime expected credit loss. If I make an estimate only based on the last 12 months, only seeing the last 12 months, I am estimating that the credit loss will be for 40 days or 44 days. That is called as 12 months expected credit loss. Clear? So there are two types of credit losses, which is called as expected credit loss over lifetime and 12 months expected credit loss. Remember guys, this credit loss is calculated based on something called as probability of default. which is called as POD. Probability of default means nothing but it is calculated in days. How do I calculate in days probability of default? Which is nothing but the date of expected payment minus the due date of payment, the day on which the amount falls due for payment, this difference is called as probability of default. So by this logic, if I have to calculate expected credit loss, I'll go like this. Expected credit loss is equal to the value of financial asset multiplied by Probability of default, how many days he will default, divided by 365 into effective interest rate, EIR as a percentage. Guys, EIR as a percentage, here EIR is based on assets. It is an asset based EIR. So what is the effective interest rate for an asset? Effective interest rate for asset is generally that is corporate deposit rate with bank a corporate deposit rate with bank can generally be called as effective interest rate for an asset since i am calculating it for a set i will calculate it based on corporate discount rate to the bank and a deposit rate to the bank and i am saying it should be calculated as financial asset multiplied by probability of default divided by 365 days into effective interest rate. So this computation of effective interest rate uses the concept of time value of money to the minute extent possible. Why minute extent? A time value of money you normally calculate it based on years, no? But here what are you doing? You are not calculating based on years. You are calculating based on days. You are saying there is a definite delay which I see from my past experience. From the day the amount falls due up to the amount, the day when the amount is received. This date's difference is called as probability of default. Based on this probability of default, I will calculate your expected credit loss using this formula. Clear? Now, my financial assets for the purpose of identifying expected credit loss are classified broadly into two categories. One is called as my trade receivables. My trade receivables are nothing but my debtors and bills receivable and other financial asset which is not trade receivables like deposits, advances, For a trade receivable, an expected credit loss should be always based on a lifetime expected credit loss. It should be based on lifetime expected credit loss.
that means over the lifetime of the enterprise what is your general tendency of loss on credit the delay delay is over the lifetime i see that it is 40 days over the lifetime i see it as 42 days that way lifetime expected credit loss should be identified if it is for other financial assets then i will see whether there is a significant increase in credit risk significant increase in credit risk when do i say that there is a significant increase in credit risk i will say that there is a significant increase in credit risk if any amount is due for more than 30 days if an amount is due for more than 30 days then i will say that there is a significant increase in credit risk if there is a significant increase in credit risk and your answer is yes then i will go as per lifetime expected credit loss but if the amount is due for less than 30 days then i need not go for lifetime expected credit loss instead i will calculate the expected credit loss based on 12 months expected credit loss so based on the last 12 months what is the estimated credit loss that you see for this financial asset? For this class of financial asset, last 12 months, last year, I only had a credit loss of 18 days. So there is no significant increase in credit risk. Therefore, I will only calculate the expected credit loss based on your 12 months expected credit loss. So that way, I will estimate based on your lifetime expected credit loss or your 12 months expected credit loss. This I will use in estimating my probability of default in estimating probability of default either i use lifetime expected credit loss or i use 12 months expected credit loss